sophomore, freshman year of high school, uh, he came to a uh, fifth quarter event that we had for Riverside football with his brother. That's where I met him. And uh, then I was his teacher at Capitol, or at, not Capitol, at South Charleston High School. Yeah. It was junior year. Yeah. yeah. You were. Yeah, for a whole three months. Yeah. Taught him absolutely nothing. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> But I, I got to watch as he developed, he started going to what was formerly Capital City Baptist Church and, and God started moving in his heart. He went from wanting to be a, uh, a the president of the United yeah. States. Yeah. I think that's what you told me. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna be the president. And to a preacher, that's a big change, that's a big change. And uh, I, I, we need more preachers. Amen. I'd say this, if we had better preaching in America, we'd have better leadership in the White House. Yeah. 100%. Um, but I'm proud of you. Uh, he took a youth pastor's job, and then the Lord now is leading him and his family. So uh, let me say that, let's see if I can say it right, Sylvania. Yeah. So yeah. Sylvania in Europe. And uh, he said he's one of uh, two mission, independent Baptist missionaries in that area. And... Uh, I'm looking forward to partnering with him, uh, this church supporting him, uh, and uh, 
we'll vote on all. We'll do all the legal stuff later. I'm just telling you, I've known this kid long enough to know he's the real deal. He ain't going over there to take your money and hang out in a castle. <laughs> there are castles there. I, I Googled it today. I was like, man, hopefully he gets to live in one of those. That'd be cool. I'm visiting if that happens. But uh, I told him I want him to talk a little bit about what he's going to be doing. But most importantly, I want him to preach the gospel. Preach God's word. That's what matters. Come on, Eli. This is Eli Cook. Put your hands together. Well, thank you all for having me uh, with you tonight. I have uh, my two children with me. My son is one and a half. He's down in your nursery, and I have my daughter who's with me. She's sitting here with my family uh, on the third row here. Uh, my wife, who's normally with me, she's just as much a missionary as I am, and she's just as much a part of this and ready to go to Slovenia as I am. She has unfortunately come down with the stomach virus. Um, our daughter had it on Easter Sunday, and it has spread to my wife, who took care of her all day Sunday and Monday. Uh, why me and my son got to do the fun stuff that comes along with the uh, Easter. And so she is now sick and she's sad that she can't be here. But thank you all for having us uh, with you tonight, especially after the day that we had yesterday. We're from Texas, my family and I, from Dallas, where uh, we served in a church, as your pastor said, for three and a half years, <clears throat> about 10 minutes north of Dallas. Tornadoes are normal in Texas, right? I've been driving home when the sirens are going off. There's a tornado on the other side of the city. It's not that big a deal. But there was something different about here. I mean, when, it, when it hit, we were at, we we're staying at uh, Restoration Baptist Church down in South Charleston, right beside the stamping plant where one touched oh, down at, and uh, the power has been been out. And so, but uh, but I, I can tell you this: I'm thankful for his protection. You know, the buildings around the church got damaged, but the only damage the church took was one broken light outside. So I'm thankful for God's protection uh, through all that. And I'm glad to see you're here. It shows that God protected you as well as some of us are without power and some without water. But hey, we're here, right? But my family and I, we've been called to the, to the country of Slovenia. If you've never heard of that, you find Italy on the map, but you look for the boot in Europe and just go northeast of the boot and you'll find Slovenia. It's a very small country, about 2.2 million people. Uh, West Virginia is not much smaller than the population size, but it's a very needy, needy place. It's former Yugoslavia, so it's former communist, and uh, that has left such an impact even over 30 years later after the collapse of Yugoslavia that most people there are uh, Roman Catholic or they're atheist. Uh, that's 92% of the country is made up of either Roman Catholicism or atheism, and which is, which is very, very sad. We got to spend a month over there last year and it's heartbreaking when you walk up to people and they laugh in your face when you try to tell them about the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, you have people that simply just push you away. Or what I think is even more sad is they've been taught wrong by the Catholic Church. They've been taught wrong by some other religion or belief system that's there about Christ. And so they try to tell you what they believe, which is completely against the Bible. And so it's a very, very needy place. Seventy-two percent of the country identifies as Roman Catholic, Twenty. Uh, atheist, then you have that last 8% that's divvied up. It's estimated there are under 400, under 400 Baptists in the whole country. Wow. And I think the number is way lower than that because as, as he said, there's one independent Baptist and then there's one Southern Baptist. That's the only, only two people that are preaching the biblical gospel in the country. I mean, we have looked high and low for other people and when we come to talk about salvation, it's always Jesus plus something else in which we know the Bible says it's Jesus alone. And if you're glad for that, Amen. And so it's, like I said, it's a very, very needy place. And, and thank God, uh, I'm, I'm so thankful God has called us there, that God has saw me and my wife. Uh, we're not fit, I can tell you that, but he makes us fit, right? Yeah. And so he, he has called us to go to that place. And we're grateful. The missionary that's there, the only independent Baptist missionary church supports in Texas, he came and he gave a report at our church. He's been over there for 15 years. Uh, and God burned in both mine and my wife's heart. And we, I'll be honest with you, we wrestled with it for about a year because when we were serving here at what was formerly Capital City Baptist down in South Charleston, and when we left, uh, I wrestled with that because when I came back from college, I was dying in West Virginia. I was going to stay here for the rest of my life and do the gospel work here because there's still a need here, right? 
And so that's what I was going to do. But God moved us to Texas, and uh, I was settling my roots down in Texas. We were, I mean, we were in the process of buying a house when God was like, no, I want you to go somewhere else. And so that was, that was hard. I'm not going to sit up here and say I was immediately obedient because that would be lying to you. But uh, as your pastor has said, uh, and, and I appreciated his kind words to me, is the gospel and the need over there is just so real. That it, it, there's no time to waste. And so I appreciate uh, the, the kind words he said. But no, we're not, we're not in the business of trying to just uh, live an easy life. Uh, as you know, the Christian life is very challenging, and especially going to a place that... Uh, it's very atheistic and, and, and very, uh, uh, very Catholic. Uh, we, we know the challenge that's ahead of us, but with the Lord we can do it, right? right. Uh, the, the gentleman that's there has been there 15 years, and he said it can get discouraging, but you have to remember why you're here. And so that's what. So thank you again for having us. Um, I, I am so grateful uh, to be able to be. I've been excited to be here just because uh, I can't believe I forgot that you, uh, you were Mr. Uh, I can't remember his name. Koski. Koski's class. Yeah, I, I remember that. You come down and did our, our student teaching for that. So, but yeah, so just thank you again. I, I can't say thank you enough for allowing us to be here with you. Our table's out there as you walk by. Please take a prayer card because even more, I say even more than financial support, we need your prayers. Um, I We need a supernatural work to happen over in Slovenia. Um, it, it really needs to be the Lord working. You know, we can do so much as man. Um, but we can't save people. Only God can. And only by the work of the Holy Spirit can he save someone. And so that's what we need. We need prayers, Moses. Please take a prayer card on your way out and please pray for us. Pray for our children. As we've only been on deputation for, uh, we're going on three months now. Here we began in January and our children are still adjusting to it. Uh, but it's good to be home. Uh, this is my whole family. So I have, my whole family is here on this row over here. It's good to have them. Good to have my friend Jacob here with me as well. But it's good to be home for a little bit. But let's open God's Word tonight. Uh, I ask you tonight to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 10, begin in verse number 38. We just have a few verses for you tonight in Luke chapter 10 and verse number 38. And uh, I, I pray this is encouraging to you, but also I pray that it's a challenge to you um, about what the Word of God says here in Luke chapter 10. In verse number 38, we'll begin reading there. And the Bible says, And now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village. A certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary. And I want you to look at where Mary was at in, in this passage. Which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving. How many of you have ever been cumbered about in your life? How many of you ever felt the weight of life on you? That's what Martha was feeling here. She was serving. And came to him and said, Lord, does thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she come help me. Or sorry, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. And here's the title of our, our message tonight. If you underline or highlight, I, I encourage you to do it. But one thing is needful. But one thing, Jesus says, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Can we pray together over the master's night? Would you pray with me there in your seat? Dear Heavenly Fathers, we humbly come before your throne once again. We are thankful to be able to gather in this church building tonight. Lord, we're thankful that the electricity is on here. And God, we, we do ask for those and every single person that's affected by this storm that rolled through yesterday. Lord, that you would give them comfort and peace right now. That you would uh, help the, the, the linemen that are out there tonight. Uh, and they've been out there all day as you help them uh, get the power restored. And Lord, that we would just give you thanks, even in hard times like this, that we would always look to you. But God, tonight we do ask during this time that you would come just meet by our way, as, as you have already in the song service. But God, we're asking you to come during the preaching and just open up our hearts and minds to receive what you have for us out of your word tonight. And Lord, I, I do thank you and I love you. It's in Christ Jesus' name that we pray tonight. Amen.
There's one thing, I, there's a rule, and I, I don't know if any of you have ever taught or preached. Uh, there's one rule that I have is I can never preach or teach on a passage of Scripture that has never touched my heart in some type of way. And I remember I was, it was not long after we had uh, moved to Texas. And, and so with, with us moving to Texas, my, thank you, brother. You was reading my mind right there. I, after we moved to Texas, I assumed the associate job, which come with a lot of different responsibilities, which uh, come with the youth, the children, but also one was cleaning. And I don't know about you, if, if you've ever cleaned before, but I love to take that opportunity just to throw headphones in and listen to podcasts and all that kind of stuff. Well, I heard this portion of scripture being preached, that one thing is needful. And what I found myself, and, and let's be honest, we find ourselves in the Christian life like this a lot, that we find ourselves a lot like Martha when we're cumbered about with much doing, right? I don't know about you, but how busy is your life? Just about every person that I meet has a busy life, right? We're always busy. We're always doing something. And what I found out is as I was cleaning, I was literally being like Martha. I was cleaning the church. And I was listening to this sermon, and God started convicting my, my heart about me putting the service before the worship of God, which is very easy to do in the Christian life. We get, we get cumbered about, we get doing a lot of things in our life that we forget about the one thing that Christ says here in our, in our passage, the one thing that is needful. Yeah. And what I found out is I was skipping, and I'll just, I'm going to be very transparent with you, right? I'm not going to try to sugarcoat or, or hide behind who I am. I found myself giving up the worship of God in order to get things done. Right. I found myself not spending time alone with God before I started my day because I was too busy, right? And, and a lot of us, we find ourselves like that. And when I heard this message, I literally put the broom, I was in the men's bathroom, I was sweeping. I put the broom against the wall and I begin praying and said, God, forgive me for forgetting that one thing. Forgive me for getting that one thing that is needful. And from that moment, I can tell there was a change in my Christian life when I began putting the one thing back in its proper place. Yeah, See, when we find Jesus here in his earthly life, we're about seven months uh, from the end. We're about seven months from the crucifixion, from the burial, and praise God, we're about seven months from the resurrection, which we just celebrated on Sunday. Amen. And Bethany was on the eastern side of, of where Jesus uh, would, or sorry, on the Mount of Olives. I messed that up. But then we find in this passage, we find some siblings, right? We find Mary and Martha. Now, look, Mary and Martha have already been mentioned before. They're very important in Christ's life. Why? Because they have a brother, which we all know who the brother is. Right? Lazarus, who, what? Jesus rose from the dead. And we find that Jesus has come and Martha has let Christ into her house. But what was Martha doing when Jesus was sitting at his proper place in the house? She was serving about. This word needful, as Christ said, one thing is needful, simply means this. It's the duty or business of someone. That's what that word needful means. It's the duty or business of someone. And this one thing, I just want to define this one thing before we dive into different things about the one thing. But this one thing that Christ is talking about is sitting and listening and learning at the feet of Jesus. If you find where Mary's at, where is she at? Where the Bible says she's at Jesus' feet. Yeah. Oh, church, how often do we need to get to Jesus' feet? Oh, how often do we miss being at Jesus' feet? How often... Yeah. Do we forget about that one thing? It's worshiping Christ for who he is, which is God. Yeah. And Mary put Christ in her in his rightful place. I want to look at this just three things about the one thing tonight, if we could. First, I want us to see this, the place of one thing. The place of that one thing. The Bible says here, Mary, which also, which also sat at Jesus' feet, heard his word. Martha didn't get the help that she wanted from her sister Mary. It wasn't that Mary was being lazy. I believe that word also means a lot in here. I think, I think Mary was serving with Martha there in the house. But when Jesus came and sat where the rabbi was supposed to sit in the house, where he took his rightful seat in Martha's house, Mary understood that the service came second, but the worship of Christ came first. 
Right. So I believe Mary was, Mary's not lazy in our passage, and that's not what we need to get from it. It's not that we need to be lazy and not serve. No, no, no. I think it's the contrary. It's that if we're spending time at Jesus' feet, the outcome or a result of spending time at Jesus' feet is that we will serve him. Amen. That we will be like Martha. But we first have to get to his feet. And that's where Martha was missing out on because I believe Mary was serving. But when Jesus came in, Mary went and sat at his feet. She knew where she needed. Martha led him into the house. Right? Martha led him into her house. But Mary let him have the right seat in the house. So that's what happens to a lot of us Christians is we let him into our house, right? We accept him. He's, he's our Savior. He's our Lord. But life gets busy. Things get in the way. We begin serving. And, and you know, you got jobs. And we have, I, I'll tell you this. We have two children, three and one. And I have never been more busy in my life than raising kids. Yeah. I don't know about you. And my wife wants to have two more. And I'm like, okay, praise the Lord. Like, I, we'll, we'll, we'll pray about it. We'll, we'll see what happens. See, we get busy. And, and what I've had to do is really to, to get that one thing, I have to get up before them. And my daughter decides to take after her dad and get up at like 7, 7.30. And so now we try to keep her up late to see if she'll sleep longer. But it can get busy. But we can't forget about the one thing. We can't forget about getting at Jesus' feet. Mary made full use of the opportunity of Jesus' visit. Can you imagine if Jesus walked into your house right now? You would want it to look immaculate, wouldn't you? I mean, it's God. It's the God of the universe and the flesh. You'd want it to look great. But I don't think, I think Jesus would rather your house look a mess yeah. and you sit at his feet. Yeah. I understand we get busy, but we can't forget about the one thing, that place of the one thing. Can I ask you something? And I, I, I really want you to listen. When is the last time you've been at the feet of Jesus? When's the last time you sat there and just listened to his word? And you sat there and, and let the word of God speak to you. You know, I used to think that only like the uber spiritual people would really spend time with Jesus. But you know what I found out? That to just make it through one day, I've got to start it with him. Because if I don't start it with him, I'm easily irritable. I could be more mean. We got to start with him. You know, back in back in these times, when a person sat at the feet of someone, the person sitting at the feet was a student, and the person whose feet was being sat at was the teacher. It was a way of sowing yes. submission to that person. That's what Mary's doing here: is she's showing submission to Christ? When we sit at His feet, we make it a daily thing to sit at Christ's feet. We're submitting. To him. And I love what, what also a passage in Luke says that we die to ourselves what? Daily. I think one of the biggest helps that ever helped me in my Christian life is the Christian life is a daily life. It's a daily life. If I submitted yesterday to him, I could submit today to him and I can submit tomorrow to him. But right now I'm worried about submitting today to him. Because the Bible says tomorrow has its own worries. Let's submit today to him. Yeah. This is our attitude. If we have this attitude of worship, it brings this humility that we humble ourselves before the feet of the Almighty. You know, here's the amazing thing. This is what I love about serving the God of the universe is we don't have to come to church to sit at his feet. Right. I love sitting at his feet in a recliner. I love sitting at his feet at the kitchen table. I love sitting at his feet in the garage. Right. I love sitting at his feet just about anywhere. Why? Because we can sit at his feet Anyway, we don't have to have to come into a building. Now, it's amazing to get together and worship together, but our personal worship, our personal time at Christ's feet, oh, it's, so, it's some of the best times I can think of with God Yeah, has been me and him at his feet. It's been amazing. You know, at this time, I believe Mary was saying that she said she didn't care about the physical things that were going on. She didn't care about the physical food. She said, I'll be fine. I need what he's saying. I need that spiritual food first. I can't do it without hearing the word from Christ. You know, every time we see this Mary of Bethany in Scripture, you know where we find her? Every account we find in the Gospels of the Mary of Bethany, every account we find her at the feet of Jesus. Why is that? Because she truly realized who Jesus was, that he's God. <clears throat> and his feet were worthy to be set. 
If we look at John 11, verse 32, Mary sat at his feet when Lazarus died. John 12, 3, Mary sat at his feet, and what did she do? She anointed his feet with this ointment that cost about one year's wage. It was a whole sermon in itself, and she washed his, his, his feet with her hair. It's amazing what happens when a person says, I'm going to make this one pl the place this one thing, make this one thing important. I love when we see about the feet of Jesus. You know, Mark 5 and Luke 8 are some of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture. Why is that? Because there's so much chaos in these chapters. You think your life's crazy? Go read Mark 5 or Luke 8 and you'll think, wow, my life's pretty normal. Go read a book. You know, every time you see, and I, I'm just going to reference Luke 8 here instead of Mark 5, but both they're, they both write about the same thing. There's the maniac of Gadara in Luke 8, 35. The demon-possessed man. You know where he found his answer? The feet of Jesus. There was uh, Jairus who, whose daughter had died. This high man of society, where did he find his answer at? The place of that one thing. He found it at the feet of Jesus. What about the woman with the issue of blood? The woman with the issue of blood, 12 years. Where did she find her answer? At his feet. Yeah. Yeah. Throughout scripture, we find that the place of this one thing is very important, the feet of Jesus. Now, one thing I have to remind myself of before we start rebuking Martha, we have to remember what I said a minute ago. Getting at Jesus' feet, the result is service. Because yeah. I don't think anywhere in Scripture calls us to a lazy Christianity, to a casual Christianity, right. to a moderate Christianity that America, a lot of American Christians are wanting to go to. Of Okay, well, I'll go on Sunday, and that's about it. Or, yeah, I'll go on Wednesday night, but the rest of the week, that's mine, Lord. You can have those two days. No, 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 no. If we're at his feet every day, be lived for Christ. Amen. When's the last time you've been to his feet? Oh, it's so important to get to his feet. It's one thing that's needful. And we'll come up with excuses. Don't think the enemy won't try to throw excuses. You think the enemy wants you at his feet? No, 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 no. He'll throw, oh, you're too busy. You're too tired. You need to do this. You need to do that. Remember how important that one thing is. Have we, been, have we become so cumbered about with many things? Are we careful and troubled about many things? Like Martha? Here's what I found out about Martha. Is Martha lived by a list. I love lists. Don't get me wrong. I love having a checklist. But Mary lived by the one thing. She understood that everything began at the one thing. So we see the place of this one thing. It's the feet of Jesus. Number two, I want you to see this. The price of one thing. There's a price to stop your day, to stop your mind, to, to concentrate on the God of the universe. It will come with a price. Right. It'll cost you something to get away from everything and get to the feet of Jesus. We cannot expect the day and age that we live in with our, I mean, I don't, know how, I don't even know where my phone's at right now. I think it's in my back. But we all have a phone in here of some sort that connects us with so many people. And we live in a world of, of this social media and stuff that how can we not expect to sacrifice something right. to get at his feet? You know, I, there's one of the worst things I can do in the mornings I'm so tempted to, as soon as I wake up, is to grab my phone and start scrolling. There's a, oh, I know. I know. I, I struggle with it. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever social media is out there. Now, it's hard. It's, we we want to know what's going on. I even started sleeping with like an actual alarm clock to actually not hear my phone and not have to touch it no more. Because there's a price. There's a price that comes with it. Right. I believe here we see a price that Mary paid to get out of I believe she was bothered by the flesh to get to this one place. You're going to be bothered by the flesh. Oh, absolutely, you're going to be bothered by the flesh to get there. The flesh and the spirit are going to battle against each other in your life. 
I believe Martha is a picture of the flesh in our account. Martha's name literally means this lady boss or mistress of the house. I believe that's why the Bible says she was named Martha. That's who she was. That was her identity. That's who she was. I can kind of imagine. Just just to, you know, just to be a little bit humorous, you know, I have a I have a mama, and I think everybody in West Virginia has a mama. Everyone in Texas like names their grandmother something else. I'm like, we just stick with one word. That's how, <laughs> just simple, right? I have a mama. Her name's Mama Pearl. My, my family knows who she is. And I can imagine that Martha's like her on holidays, in the kitchen with a rag over her shoulder, maybe a hand on her hip when she's telling Christ how it is. I mean, she really went to Jesus and basically said, you don't care about me because you're letting her sit here and not help me. Right. You think that Mary was deaf and didn't hear Martha talking about her when she was sitting at her feet? <laughs> oh, she was bothered by the flesh. She was bothered by someone else around her about her getting to the feet of Jesus. You might have met a Martha. She's happy to serve, but then the service turns sour and they start complaining. I've been there. I've been a Martha. Maybe you've been a Martha. Maybe you are Martha. I, I don't think the flesh told Mary to go sit at his feet. She was bothered by the flesh. Not only that, she was misunderstood by the world around her. She was absolutely misunderstood by the world around her. You know, only people allowed at the feet of a rabbi were men back in this time. Only men were allowed at the feet of the rabbi. And here's a woman of Bethany who's sitting at his feet. You know who the last woman who sat at the feet of the rabbi was recorded in the scripture? Ruth. How far along was that ago? No matter what the flesh or the world thought, Mary knew where she needed to be. Mary paid the price. Mary paid the price. She fought against the flesh. She let the world ridicule her. But she got to the feet of Jesus and heard the word that he spoke. I'll tell you this. Getting to the feet of Jesus also requires us to do this, which we're not very good at in life, is to pause. You ever get pause on a movie to stop it? Or maybe to go back? <clears throat> Getting to the feet of Jesus requires us to pause. Because the Bible says Mary sat at his feet. Don't be wrong, I love staying busy. I love feeling like I accomplished something with my day. But I have to pause. We, as Christians, we as people who, who worship and serve God and live for Christ, must pause every day to get into his presence. Can I ask you something? When's the last time you sacrificed something to get to his feet? When's the last time? You're going to have to sacrifice something. After we had kids, I'll be honest with you, I had to sacrifice some sleep. We all love to sleep, right? Some of you are like, yeah, I understand. My, my kids get up early too. Some of you are like, I don't want to get out of bed. That's the flesh. That's, you're going to have to pause. You're going to have to sacrifice something. Isn't he worthy to sacrifice our time for? Amen. I'll never forget, I read a story, and you might know it, might not, D.L. Moody, he's kind of famous at times in some people. I've never, I never heard of him telling off to Bible college, to be honest with you. And so I heard a story about D.L. Moody, that he was sitting in his office, and you know, he was studying and, and trying to get ready for Sunday sermon, and one of his children came in there, and they were messing around, and they were trying to get up on his lap. And D.L. Moody finally looked at his child and said, what do you want? You know what, his, his little child looked up at him with tears in his eyes and said, I just want to sit in your lap and spend time with you. Right. As a child of God, God wants to hear that from you. Yeah. Amen. It makes my heart so happy when one of my children want to come sit in my lap. They don't want anything from me. They just want to be with me. How many of us was the last time we just went and wanted to be with God? Have we made God's presence a priority in our life? Yeah. It'll cost us something. It'll be a cost. 
But I promise you this, it's worth it. Right. It's worth it. So we see the place of one thing. We see the price of one thing. Lastly here, I want you to see this. There's the power of one thing. Yeah. There's the power of one thing. There's three victories that came to Mary over getting to this one play, this one thing. First, I want you to see is it gave her victory over herself. It gave her victory over herself. You know, Mary is the Greek name for the Hebrew name Miriam, which means this. You go back and, and you read any of the Old Testament, you'll find where Miriam is, it means bitter. It means bitter. How many people become Miriams in our day where we get very bitter about things? I, you know, I, and this is just a rabbit I'm going to chase, and I'm going to come back to the trail real quick. Bitterness, I heard it described best like this. It's a poison I take open that affects the other person. Bitter. Mm. Her name was literally telling her to be bitter. Right. Can I tell you this? The flesh, the world will tell you to live and to be one way. But when you get at the feet of Jesus, he shows you to be like him. How amazing is that? that the more time we spend with Jesus. You know what I found out in my life? The more time I spend with someone, the more I begin to act like them. And the more they begin to act like me. And that's pretty scary if they start acting like me. The more I've been married to my wife, we're going on five years now, the more I've realized that I've rubbed off on her, and thank God she's rubbed off on me. I needed that. I heard. I just heard somebody say amen from my family. <laughs> I understand. You know what happens when we spend more time with Jesus? You know what's going to happen? We're going to become more like him. And that's what our name Christian means, right? We're little Christ. We're supposed to be Christ-like. I believe what 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, that after somebody meets Jesus, they're different. Why is that? They're a new creature in Christ. Sorry, uh, 5.17. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, all things, behold, look, behold, all things have become new. I believe that's why the Bible called her Mary. Right? Martha was named Martha, but Mary was called. Mary, but she wasn't the same person because why? She'd been at the feet of Jesus. Right. Some of us in here need to get to the feet of Jesus so ourselves get defeated. We must die to ourselves. The flesh must die. Why is that? Because the spirit, right? When we're saved, we, have, we still live in the flesh. But aren't you thankful the Spirit lives in us now and we can be led and guided and we can depend upon the Holy Spirit to live every day? Amen. One victory, the power of this one thing was she got, she got victory over herself. But I want you to see another victory she got. She got victory over her heritage. Yeah. Bethany, <laughs> the house of affliction. Bethany. You know, it was funny when, when I studied into this and I found out more about Bethany, and that's what it meant. Bethany means the house of affliction. How would you like it if your name was blank of Bethany? Meaning whatever your name was, they knew you were from the house of affliction. Isn't that a great last name? Yeah. Wonderful. Listen to what Bethany. Bethany is the town where they would dump the old day palm trees from Jerusalem. And what happened is these trees would lay here and they would rot and they would begin to smell. And people could tell that you were from Bethany because you smelt like rotting day palm trees. People knew Mary was from Bethany because of the way she smelled. Figuratively, you know, when we're with Christ, we begin to act like him. We begin to smell like Christ. But also physically, people know who you are by the way you live your life. People can tell by your actions. You don't have to turn there, but John 12, I believe Mary was changed after the resurrection of her brother, Lazarus. There was something different about Mary. Why is that? Because in John 12, she brings this spikenard ointment. This ointment that was worth a year's wages. I wonder if she had that ointment to cover up her smell of day palm trees that was rotting in Bethlehem. I always wondered why, and you know, I'm just speculating here, just a, a thought. Why would she spend a year's wages on ointment? On something to make her smell good? 
But what does she do with this ointment, church? She goes and breaks it at the feet of Jesus and begins to wash his feet with her tears in her hair. I wonder, when she walked out of that house, that she anointed the feet of the Savior, you know she smelled different. She didn't smell like rotting gay palm trees anymore after she left the feet of Jesus. Man. She smelled like that spike nard oil. They could tell she'd been with Jesus. And her hair, the Bible, her, she was given all. Can you imagine washing somebody's feet with your hair? She was submitting. She was giving all the glory to God. Mary was different. She might have been from the house of affliction, but she didn't act like it no more. Your past doesn't mean you have to act like that. Yeah. Just like Mary. Mary was from Bethany, but she didn't act like she was from Bethany. My wife always gets on to me. Because I'm, you know, if you know anything about Route 60, I grew up most of my life in Quincy Hollow, if you know where that's at. And there was always a saying that you can take the boy out of the holler, but you can't take the holler out of the boy. And she always gets on to me when I share stories about when I was growing up, you know, all the crazy things that my family would do and I would watch them do it. And I, I would never participate in it. <laughs> <laughs> and she would always, she's like, Eli, you kind of embarrass me with, with them stories you tell about, you know, from the hollers of West Virginia. And I love, I can say that here because you know what I mean? Down in Texas, they're like, well, it's a holler. Yeah. They have no clue. <laughs> I can tell you this. I'm from the hollers of West Virginia. I've been out of them for a while now, but I still tend to, you can hear it. <laughs> but I love that Mary didn't act like she was from Bethany anymore because she was changed. Here's, here's what's going to happen. The enemy is going to tell you to act how your past tells you to act. Don't listen to it. Why? Because Christ has made, if you're saved in here, if you put your faith and trust on Christ, you're a new creature and you can start to act like Christ. Right. Amen. Amen. Start spending time with him. Thirdly, I want you to see this last, the last thing that she got victory over was her hurt. The power of the one thing gave her victory over her hurt. John 11, Lazarus dies. Can you imagine the hurt that Martha and Mary were feeling in losing a sibling? I have a lot of siblings, to be honest with you. This is how our family's made up. And I cannot imagine my life without a single one of them. A single one of them. A couple of them are sitting here with us tonight. Could you, do you have siblings in here? Could you imagine if you was to lose one of them? The devastation. That's what happened with, with Martha and Mary. And if you go to John 11 and you see what happens is Martha went out and met Jesus before he even got to her house. And what does she say? What does she say? Lord, if you'd have been here, he would have been alive. He would not have died. Right. What does Jesus say? Sorry, your brother will rise again. He, and Martha's like, I know, I know he's going to rise in the last day. And Jesus is saying, just trust me. I'm the resurrection. I'm the life is what Christ keeps saying. There. Anyone that believes in me, they're never going to die. What? They're going to live. Aren't you glad for that promise for every yes. believer that we're, that we're yes. going to live for eternity yes. with Christ yes. in the presence of God? That's what he tells me. And Martha says, I believe you're the Christ. And she goes and finds Mary. She says, Jesus wants you. And Mary, I, I don't believe Mary wasted no time. If you read them, she, I think she made hay. She ran to where Jesus was at. And before she got up to Jesus, remember what I said a minute ago. Every time we read about Mary of Bethany, where do we find her at? At his feet. At his feet's an important place. Before she got up to his face, before she got up to him, I believe she thought, I don't belong at his face. I belong at his feet. She says the very same thing as Martha said, but gets a different response. Why? Because of her humility, and she found herself at his feet. See the power of this one thing? This Mary found victory over her hurt, and look where she found it. She found it at the feet of Jesus Christ. 
Look, I know there's a lot of hurt in our day and age. We took up prayer requests, and there were some people that sounded like they were they were hurting. Can I tell you this? I'm, I'm not saying it's a fix-all. I'm not doing some prosperity preaching. But I can tell you this. There's a peace that passes all understanding that, that God can give you. Get to his feet. Get to his feet. Some of you have some pain in your life. You're struggling with some pain in your life. You've been hurt. You've been holding on to it. It's the last time you took it to his feet. It's the last time you just laid it out to him. I read in Psalm 20, or 62, 8, it talked about praying before God, and it said, pour out your heart. I used to think that we couldn't be real honest with God in our prayers, and then I began praying, and I, I'm thankful, and I, I explained this at my table. I've been, I began praying through the Psalms, and I realized how honest David was when he would go and pray before God, when he would go before the feet of the creator, how he would pour out his whole heart. Right. And I began to say, God, I'm pouring out everything. I'm not holding anything back. You already know my thoughts. I don't know why I got to feel like I got to be superficial and hide them, but I'm going to pour it out. And look, some of you are like, man, should I really tell the Lord that? Yes. Talk to, the, talk to God. He wants you to talk to him. He wants you to be at his feet. I love the Bible says he's a friend that sticketh closer than the brother. You have friends? You talk to him about your hurt? Won't you talk to the friend that will stick close to you no matter what? As he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. You want to get victory over your hurt? Take your hurt. I'm not Amen. saying it's going to be taken away. I'm not going to say you're going to forget about it. But I can tell you this. He will give you that peace Amen. that the world and no one else can give. Amen. Amen. That's right. Take it to his feet. Let me ask you, is the Lord your portion tonight? We read the Lord is my portion. Even in Lamentations 3.24, we see he is your portion. It's your portion right. tonight. Go sit with him. Go listen to what he has to say. Go talk to him. That's one thing I found out. I, I don't know why I was struggling. I, like some of you, I was struggling in my prayer life. I told my pastor, and this one, this probably like six months ago. I was like, I just don't feel like praying. I said, I feel like I pray about the same thing every time, and I don't feel like God's listening to me. And he gave me, he said, look, I, I want to help you start praying scripture. Okay. And he gave me this book, and I read, and it changed my life. I'm like in Psalm 43 now. I've read through, through all this, and I can tell you this, my prayer, I'm excited to talk to God now. I'm excited. Like, I have no clue what I'm going to talk to him about, but whatever I read in scripture and whatever comes to my mind, I talk to him about. I found this. I talk to him about what needs to be talked about, and I spend a lot of time in prayer in the morning. He wants you at his feet. He wants his child at his feet. Amen. I want to finish. I want to wrap up with this. There's three type of Christians, I, I believe, shown in our account that really hit home about this one thing. There are people like Martha. You're busy. You're diligently serving God. You're diligently serving God, but you've forgotten about the one thing that is needed. You forgot about the one. And look, I, I've been there. I'm not here to, to make you feel bad. I'm here to say I understand. But God wants you to get back to that one thing. Can I tell you this? There's Christians that aren't doing either. They're not getting that one thing and they're not serving at all. Start spending time with him and you'll start serving. Right. right. Lastly, there's people here that are like Mary. Those that serve and said at Jesus' feet, don't stop. Don't stop. Please, please, that we need more Christians serving and getting at his feet. I'm going to hand it over to you, Pastor, after this. But how is your walk with God? Oh, we need more people walking with God, don't we? Your pastor mentioned about our country that we'd be in a lot better place. We'd be in a lot better place if Christians would truly start walking with the God, with yeah. God, the Creator. I don't have anything to ask that night. We'll go into prayer. But how is your walk? With God, can we pray tonight? Dear Heavenly Father, as we humbly come before your throne once more, we are just thankful to see this passage. We're thankful to see the importance of the one thing, the place of getting at your feet, the price that's going to require sacrifice on us, but thank God for the power that only comes from you when we get to that one place, to that one thing. God, work on our hearts tonight the only way that you can. We thank we love you. It's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before we go, I, I do want to ask you.
bow your head just for a second for me. Nobody looking around. You're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. It's hard for you to sit at his feet when you don't know him. If you're here today and you can say without a shadow of a doubt that you believe that Jesus is your Savior and you've called on him as such. Would you raise your hand and give testimony? I know that I've been saved. Maybe you're one of those people who couldn't raise their hand today and you say, Preacher, you know what I'd like to know? I'd like to know that Jesus is my Savior. I'd like to have some assurance in my life that He is my Savior. Will you pray for me? And I will. And they'll call you out and they'll come where you are. Just like to pray for you. Amen. 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 Maybe you're here today and you're a Christian and you're saying, Preacher, will you pray for me? If I could always keep that one thing in mind put myself at his feet and I could get closer and I could walk with him stronger than I ever have. Amen. Amen. How about we do this so many hands across the room and I, I want to pray for you but I, you know it's not as good as praying for yourself. Can't, I can't make a commitment for you but you can only make that commitment for yourself and I want to invite you one's already come. I'm going to ask you how many people step out of their seat, come down to this altar and say, God, remind me of that one thing. Jesus, I want to get closer to you, Jesus. I want to be at your feet. I want to grow where you are. Maybe you're one of those people that raised your hand and said that you didn't know if you've ever been saved and you'd like to know. I want to invite you to come to this altar. to look over to you. 
Lord, I pray that you remind us just how strongly you're there. That we may walk with you closer, talk with you more, and live for you forever. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Aren't you thankful you come to church tonight? Yeah. Amen. I want to remind you, uh, we do have church on Sunday. Easter is over, but we will have church. Uh, I'm going to subtle, subtly put that out there on Facebook this week. And we, you know, you know, we don't just have church once a year, you know, it's all the time. Every, every Sunday, every Wednesday. Uh, but again, we'll have baptism after church on Sunday morning. Then uh, Sunday night, we'll have communion and then uh, some, a, little, a little preaching, a little singing, and some time of fellowship together. Uh, and that'll be at 6 o'clock. So I want to ask uh, Brother Eli to step back to his table, uh, love on him a little bit. Tell him how much you appreciated him being here. He's going to take the boss with him, it looks like. And uh, she, did a, she does a good job. The first service she had to tell All right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, man, why don't you come on back up here?